and welcome to Let Them Talk. I'm Paul DiRienzo. We've got a great show in store for you today. It's going to be, uh, we're going to be proud to have, have returning with us for the fourth time on this show, Nicholas Hayward, who's going to talk about uh, the specifics of police violence and police murder in the housing projects of New York City, which is an area that has not really been discussed and which has an entire subset of activities and events that have happened that are quite shameful to our city and should and need to be addressed. In particular, Nicholas Hayward Sr., who's with us, um, knows what he's talking about because his son uh, was 13 years old 20 years ago when he was uh, shot to death while playing in a housing project in Brooklyn. And we'll be hearing more about that story and linking it to the story of Akai Gurley, who uh, recently uh, was killed in almost the same way, 20 years almost to the day. Uh, with the same, we'll, we'll talk to, to, uh, to Nicholas and find out about what reasons were given for these tragedies and, and why it is that nobody seems to be getting in trouble for these things, no matter how many times they happen over and over again. Anyway, over this weekend, I had the opportunity to be at the uh, Millions March in New York City rally. Uh, I Can't Breathe for Eric Garner, for all the victims of police brutality. It was a wonderful turnout, uh, 50, 60, 70,000 people, maybe more, uh, filling the streets of New York City with uh, the joy of resistance. So uh, let's go to a clip. It's about a minute and a half, and then we'll be back and talk about uh, some specific cases. <laughs> That was a little bit from the rally, which uh, well over 50,000 people attended, and which sent a powerful message, I think, to the powers that be. I hope it did anyway, that uh, folks, uh, there's a new generation of foot that is going to put up with things the way they've been going on for so long. Uh, my guest, Nicholas Hayward, welcome again, Nicholas, to our show, to Let pleasure. Them Talk. My pleasure. Good to have you on. And, uh, and you um, have discussed this story, and some of our regular listeners and viewers might know about it, but others might not, about how your son, Nicholas Hayward Jr., a 13-year-old child, was killed by NYPD officer Brian George in the Gowanus Houses in Brooklyn on September 27th, 1994. Maybe tell us a little bit about the background of that story, and then we could talk about it in comparison to the recent killing on November 20th, 2014, of Akai Gurley, who was 28 years old, who was killed by an NYPD officer named Peter Liang in the Lewis H. Pink Houses, and in which there seems, from what you tell me here, almost word-for-word -word congruency between the statements made by officials in both cases, although 20 years have separated them, and I assume many cases happened in between. So maybe you could begin by telling us a little bit about your son and the situation that occurred. And I know it's very difficult, and as you told me earlier, this has been a terrible, painful 20 years for you. It's been very, very, very hard for me uh, these last 20 years. Um, my son, uh, Nicholas Jr., he was a uh, 13-year-old honor student. Uh, he was playing with some friends of his. They were playing a game of cops and robbers. They all had uh, plastic toy guns. Mind you, none of them looked at anything close to a real weapon. Uh, it was brought to my attention by uh, the district attorney, uh, Charles Hines, at the time, that uh, he put out a statement saying uh, the officer was on a 911 call, the stairwell lighting was dimly lit, things happened in a split second, and he labeled it a, a tragic accident. He actually blamed the 
the uh, incident on realistic looking toy guns. And he had a press conference um, uh, uh, saying that the, uh, the author, he blamed the toy guns and he's, mm -hmm. he cleared the officer. He didn't even present the case to a grand jury. He said that the, or the guns that the, the toy guns the kids had looked at completely real. They, you couldn't be mistaken for a fake weapon. This here is the plastic pop gun that my son was holding. I usually would bring this around to a lot of the demonstrations that I have so that people can see that when Charles Hines presented uh, the case and, and saying that he was closing the, closing the case after his investigation, mm -hmm. he had a table full of uh, plastic black and silver realistic looking toy guns opposed to he had in his possession the toy guns that the kids was playing with. Why did he not present those case at the press conference to show the people exactly what these children were playing with. Why don't you think he did? Because he wanted to take the blame off of the officer and place it on the, the toy guns and the children uh, having toy guns that looked it real, which mm -hmm. the children didn't. And right. then he wanted to blame the, the steel lighting being dimly lit, mind you. The day after I, uh, the incident of them killing my son, I went up there. The stereo lighting, it, was no, it wasn't dimly lit. It was able to see well. So that right there, I mean, as far as I'm concerned with, with the Akai case, this is another means of they trying to cover the case up. Right. I don't believe actually any of their investigations, none of them. I believe that they are all cover-ups. They don't allow the officer to say anything, and they're trying to do whatever they can to get the officer off, to clear the officer of any wrongdoing, which is what they've been doing in every single case. Now, in, in this in this uh, handout, which you, which I just had a chance to take a look at, uh, you mentioned some what seemed to me uh, eerie similarities in what was said in both the girly and in your son's case. And here's a picture of your son, 13 years old, honor student, and Akai Gurley, who uh, uh, was a father, a hardworking man, and trying to... Uh, Absolutely. And uh, was going, no, entering the uh, stairwell with his girlfriend. Right. To and go somewhere within his building where he lived. Right, exactly. And uh, and uh, the point, let's see, uh, Bill, this is interesting enough to put this up, Fire Bratton. Now, Bill Bratton was the police commissioner at the time your son was killed. Those are, there is so many similarities in the case with Nicholas and Akai. Bill Bratton was the police commissioner when my son was murdered. He's also the uh, police commissioner now when Akai is murdered. And <clears throat> the fact that the stairwell lighting was dimly lit, they said the same thing in both, both, uh, both cases. They said it was a tragic accident. They say it's a tragic accident in, in Nicholas's case. They say it's a tragic accident mm -hmm. in the Akai case. These are not tragic accidents. The officers were both rookie cops also. The officer that shot mm -hmm. Nicholas was a rookie cop. The officer that shot Akai was a rookie cop. But mind you, they went through their training process. So for in order for you to put an officer in the street with an armed weapon, we would assume that you did the proper training. He went through all of the proper trainings, you know, to, to patrol those communities and well, see the, to it that the community is safe, as your claim right. that they're there for. Uh, not to say that anything justifies anything like this happening. Uh, the officer had his finger on the trigger while he was gun out, entering a stairwell. Uh, there's a couple of problems I can see there. Number one to live in such terror and fear on the job that you would enter a stairwell or you would not enter any building or part of a building without your gun already drawn and ho uh, uh, out of its holster, that tells me something about what you think of the community where you're policing. Absolutely. That's absolutely. Right? And, uh, and number two, that uh, his finger would be on the trigger, which is in violation of even in the army, Right. In the worst of combat, in every war movie you've ever seen, in every war situation that I can think of, and any person I've known who's been a soldier has told you, you always keep your finger off the trigger till you're ready to shoot. They train you that. Exactly. That. Especially in a housing complex where you have hundreds of families living there coming in and out of their apartments. I mean, every minute of the hour, people right, coming in and out, up and down the stairwell. How do you go open up a stairwell door? With your hand, here's how he used his, the, the, the hand that he had his, right. the gun in to open the stairwell door. And then even if it went off accidentally, guns don't go off by accident. You have to squeeze the trigger. And then after he did this, after he shot a Kai, 
He didn't go to see or right. what was wrong or, or who he shot or if he shot anyone. Right. He went the other way. He got on the phone and he called his union's representative. Right. So the, what what this represents to me in both the case of Nicholas and what, what did the officer do after he shot your son? And I know this is difficult, and I'm, uh, but I want to tell, we need to get the word out. So what happened? What, what did happened do? after the officer shot Nicholas, he was just standing there walking around in a circle. He didn't know what to do. It was a neighbor that came out of the door, out of her apartment and seen, seen my son. She knew Nicholas. She said, oh, she said, I, I know him. She said that uh, he's walking. He said she told him, call an ambulance, call 911. She was yelling at the officer to call 911. So he finally called 911 and she runs down to get my wife. My wife comes running up. She ran up 14 flights of steps. Thank you. Once she got there, they refused to allow uh, Angela to see her son. They told her, you cannot see him. They didn't allow her to ride in the ambulance with him or anything. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the whole thing is that it's, it's, it's a cover-up from the very, very... That's unusual incident. that they wouldn't let you ride in the ambulance. Exactly. I rode, rode in the ambulance with, with uh, people I barely knew who I called 911 to help. And I wanted to see that they were all right, and I rode in the ambulance with them, and it was no problem. Why yep. wouldn't you be allowed to travel in the ambulance with your own child. Let me bring this to the, to, uh, the listeners' attention also. Also, there was a young, uh, a young man who came up the steps when he heard the shots also. Uh, his name was Cornelius Cook. He was from the community. He knew Nicholas. And he, he was also uh, there. And this is, this is what Cornelius Cook told me weeks after this happened, that the officers, the first officers that arrived on the scene wanted to place a real gun on Nicholas. I brought this to the attention of District Attorney Charles Hines also. And I'm hoping right now, because I've been into talks with the new uh, District Attorney Ken Thompson, I campaigned for him, and I'm hoping that he would listen to uh, what I have to tell him. I have a deposition, which I also had the opportunity to present this deposition to Charles Hines too. I brought the deposition to Charles Hines' office back in 2002. Mm -hmm. Charles Hines, I came to, into my community in 2001 claiming that there was uh, a big, dr a big drug, b drug bust of gang members and, and they had a big board with different mm -hmm. faces supposed to be gang members, which turned out that was a lie. Those wasn't gang members. They were just regular addicts from around the community. And he said that they were terrorizing the community and holding the community hostage. A big lie. And I was like, wow. So I had the opportunity to speak to the press and to him, address him after he finished telling what he wanted to tell the community. But everyone in the community already knew that that was a lie. There was no uh, people being held hostage in the Gowanus houses back in 2001 and 2002. It never happened. I've been in there for practically all my life. I, I never witnessed any, any residents in the, in the community being held hostage. But still, he went on with this uh, charade of his, uh, and he had them uh, people on the, on the board who he claimed were, were uh, gang members, which they weren't. But I had the opportunity to address him, and I explained to him that the only gang that comes in this community harassing any of the, commun any of the residents in the community was the ones that standing there behind you, and they had it where his police was at. It was the police that only comes into these uh, housing communities mm -hmm. and harasses the people. And I told him I, had to, I was trying vigorously to get in contact with you because I have evidence that states that is actually contradictory to your reasons in finding for closing my son's case. I told him that if you remember, my son was murdered in this co community here, and you closed the case on him and you justified it with by saying it was a realistic. The gun that played toy guns that they had were realistic. I said, but they weren't. And I said in the deposition, the officer is contradicting what you're saying. And uh, he was saying he's basically he's getting all red in the face. Do you while have I'm the do you have the so. deposition here? What yes, you, yes, know, I do have the uh, deposition. I can it imagine him getting red in the face. So. Yeah, yeah, what, he, what was was getting, like, he was getting like real red. He was getting red in the face because with Nicholas Hayward, whose uh, son uh, twenty years ago was uh, uh, playing in the in the in the hallway of his own home and was shot by an officer who had his gun drawn with his finger on the trigger. Uh, when he entered a, which he said at the time was dimly lit, but was later shown to be fully and well lit. Exactly. And um, and he shot the kid dead. And then, you know, 20 years later, we have Akai Gurley, almost the exact same story, almost the exact same story from the officers involved. Uh, it makes you think. Uh, you say here, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. Right to this story because how could the same exact thing happen over and over again? Exactly. And what does see one of the things that I like to get into is what does it say about what the police's attitude towards the community where they're policing? 
First off, in order for you to put, uh, I don't even like using the word policing. Oh, yeah. In order for you to come into a community, you, uh, you say that you are serving and protecting the, the residents there. Yeah. You have to first have love for the people in the community. That's number one. I'm, I'm a human being. I love all human life. And it's you coming into the community claiming that you're serving and protecting, you first have to have, a, you have, to have love for the community, for the people. Yeah. Black, white, Asian, I don't care what nationality, what religion, or what race you are, you have to love the people. Whether it's a poor minority community or a rich community. The implication and is they do not come into your community with a feeling of love for the people who live there. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. There is no love in, in, you know, for, for uh, the residents in poor minority communities. And you can basically see it from the time they enter into the community. That there is no love on the, these officers' faces. And, and you can also tell by the way they address you, the way they talk to you. No courtesy, no respect. Even the CPR, courtesy, nope. professionalism, respect? None of that. You don't see that, none of that in, in uh, Interesting. NYPD. Let's, now, you have a deposition from the officer in the case of your son. And this deposition is basically stating, the, the, the deposition is, is stating, mind you, this officer Brian George is saying that he's seen the children playing in the, from an adjoining roof. He first entered into uh, 417 Baltic Street. He went to the rooftop. And he said while he was on the rooftop, he looked across and he seen kids running back. He didn't use the word kids. He said people mm -hmm. running back and forth on the roof. So my lawyer during questioning said, what did you do? He said he stood back. He said he stood back and he observed for about a minute or two. Then he came down from 417 and he entered into 417. Uh, 23. He said it was uh, tenant patrol there. He said he didn't say anything to the to the resident to the tenant patrol there, which from what I understand is a lie. Also, tenant patrol said they did um, talk to the uh, officer before he went up into the elevator, and one of them said there was kids in here playing, and they did have re uh, them plastic toy guns. So he got onto the elevator with a couple of other uh, residents in the community. The elevator made stops on the um, different floors or whatever. So he made it to the 14th floor. He said after he exited the, the uh, elevator, he went to one stairwell. He said he just looked up, and he looked up the stairwell, and he didn't see anyone. So he made his way to the other stairwell. First off, you go into the rooftop. You're not just going to look up to the stairwell. You said you've seen people from the uh, one roof to the other. So you're supposed to be going up them stairs to the roof to see who's up there. Mm -hmm. But he's saying in his deposition that he only... Looked up, he ain't seen no one, so he made his way to the other exit. There's two exits in, in uh, the housing complex. So he said when he got to the, to the other exit, he removed his gun and his, had a flashlight in the other hand. And mind you also, he's saying this stairwell wasn't dimly lit. Why are you pulling the flashlight out? <laughs> but anyway, he said he used the, um, the hand that he had the gun in to open the door. Same thing as the Akai's, exact same thing. I used the hand to, to open the the, 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 uh, the same hand they had the gun in to open the door. So exactly, a, right. a, a very strange way to hold the gun. Exactly. And then, and then he says that this is the part that very vividly troubling, but it's a basic lie. He said that once he opened the door, he said he didn't see anyone there. So my lawyer says, that, so then what happened? He said, then... Uh, Someone jumped, jumped down, Nicholas jumped down in, in, uh, from the steps in front of him. Well, what did you do then? He said, I didn't do anything. He said, he just, he was watching him. He said, then Nicholas jumped back up the steps. He still didn't do it. He said, then he jumped back down the steps. Then he turned, pointed to a gun and started clicking it. He said he heard two clicks and that's when he shot him. The children that were there which who told the story to uh, the district attorney's investigators the very next day, not 48 hours or however long they allowed this officer to be quiet. They told him to the, to the uh, district attorney the very next day that when Nicholas seen this, the officer, he immediately dropped the toy gun and said, we're only playing, we're only playing. Which is, to my degree, is the, uh, the correct story because, mind you, a year before Nicholas was murdered, he was falsely arrested in the Gowanus community. Officer had came, uh, Nicholas was with me and my wife, and we were standing in front of the, the front of the building. And excuse me, uh, we were standing in front of the front of the building, and the cops came in and they was chasing some of the kids. And 
I had a little a dog, small dog at the time. And the dog started, the officer ran and he tackled one of the youth in front of us. And the dog, the little dog started barking. He pulled the gun and, and said, get your dog or I'm going to shoot him. So I grabbed the dog, I brought him in the house and I came back outside. When I come back outside, we just standing there and we just, you know, just watching how these police are, you know, doing this, um, arresting these kids or whatever. So we standing there and the officer who tackled the kid and pulled the gun on and told me to get the dogs. He comes walking over to us. His name was Officer Clark. He comes walking over to us, and he grabs Nicholas, point the gun in Nicholas' face. I said, whoa. I said, wait a minute. I said, I, I said, excuse me, but that's my son. He didn't do anything. I said, what are you doing? He turned and pointed the gun at me and told me, no, be quiet, mind your business. I said, what? So my wife said, Nick, be quiet, be quiet. I said, no, what do you mean be quiet? This guy got a gun in Nicholas' face. What is wrong with you? So my wife grabbed me. They went and brought Nicholas over to the, where they had all of the other kids at. And I went over there and I spoke to the sergeant. I said, excuse me, sir. I said, that's my son. My son did not do anything. He's 12 years old. He didn't do anything. I said, y'all got the wrong person. That's not, that's not the kid y'all looking for. He said, uh, he don't know what's going on right now. He said, I, I just got here. He said, um, just give me some time. You know, I'm going to see what's going on here. They just immediately picked Nicholas up, put him in the car, handcuffed him, put him in the car, and took him to the precinct. I uh, gets in my car, me and my wife, we goes to the precinct. We waiting down there for at least an hour and a half. They finally brings Nicholas downstairs. Nicholas, soon as he gets to, as soon as he sees us, he's ready to just run right past us out. I had to stop him. I had to stop Nicholas. Wait, wait. I said, wait a minute, Nicholas. Where you go? The officer uh, said, we're sorry, but he's not the one we were looking for. And, then, you know, and this was a I year before they actually, another officer actually killed him playing in the hallway of the same building. Absolutely. The officer said he's not the, the person they were looking for. I said, okay. I said, okay. I said, Nicholas, what? He said, no, let's go, Dad. Let's go. Let's go. I said, wait a minute, Nicholas. I said, I'm what, what, what happened? What, what, what did they do to you upstairs? He said, Dad, can we just go? I said, Nicholas, we're going to go home. Just tell me what happened. He said, I was telling them that I didn't do nothing. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. I didn't do, I didn't do anything. I said, I, I told him. He said, he told him that he was with his mother and his father and he was standing out. He said, I kept telling him. He said, and then the officer told him, if you don't shut up, I'm going to take this gun and stick it up your butt and pull the trigger. And he said, then another cop, he said, that another cop told me that I'm not going to live to be 15. I'm like, wow. That, 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 I mean, that right there, you know, it blew my mind. I went and I filed a complaint with the CCRB. Can you show it? Let's this is the report up. I filed with the CCRB. It was just so sickening, you know, because I get the results from, uh, the, from this complaint in 1999. It actually came out after... Um, after the Diallo case, uh, after the Diallo murder, they um, sent me the, the results of, of their investigation from the CCRB. And they said in the complaint, I'm sorry, I was looking for the, com the complaint. Mm -hmm. I couldn't find it. But in the complaint, it said that they found the officer's actions to be lawful and proper. And what they did to Nicholas uh, in 1993. That right there, I mean, it, it was, that's, I mean, to, today I have no faith in to traditional fishing. I mean, I honestly don't. I also filed a complaint with uh, Civil Rights Division, Civil Rights Violations on Nicholas. This sickening letter, this is a sickening response from the Federal Bureau of Investigations. Dear Mr. Hayward, the Civil Rights Division recently completed its review of the investigative report submitted by its Federal Bureau of Investigation concerning allegations that Nicholas Hayward was the victim of a criminal violation of the federal civil rights statutes. After a careful review of that report, we concluded that this matter lacks prosecutive merit, and we closed our file. Accordingly, we intend to take no further action. Thank you for bringing this matter to our attention. This division is dedicated to the enforcement of federal criminal civil rights statutes. We appreciate your cooperation in our effort to achieve that goal. Sincerely, Albert N. Moskowitz, Section Chief Criminal Section Civil Rights Division, U.S. Department of Justice, October 1st, 1999. It's sad and sickening because, I mean, and like I say, I don't have any faith in 
Federal Bureau of Investigation or any of them. And there's a lot of parents today who's doing their best to get their cases to the federal. A lot mm -hmm. of people, you know, wants the federal to take charge and take over. We I don't have any faith in, in, uh, we, in, in We spent so much time on your story, and I'm glad we did. Uh, I wanted to, these are just some of the folks who, uh, according to your report, at least 367 people have been killed by NYPD since Nicholas Hayward Jr., 129 since Sean Bell, that was in 2006, and he was a 23-year-old uh, husband-to-be who was uh, shot to death uh, coming out of uh, a party. Right, exactly. He you was know, doing nothing. He, he, he was killed right before his wedding. And uh, we have Brianna Ojeda, 11 years old, and we had the Ojeda family here on this show. Right. And they talked about okay. how their daughter... They were prevented from the police by the police from taking their daughter who was having an asthma attack to the hospital. Right. Because they were driving down the wrong side of the street. Eric Garner, uh, allegedly selling Lucy cigarettes, but no evidence of it, really. Uh, again, That's a violation, though. And then not, you know, Dennis That's Volchin, you know, James DeVito. Not everybody is black and Latino. Mostly are. You know, Felix Cross. Right. Kamani Gray, 16 years old. Right. Uh, Zach Binger, 21. Emmanuel Polino, Denise Gray. We have a woman, 56-year-old woman, Denise Gray. Chantel uh, Davis. Uh, uh, Chantel Davis. I met her family. In, um, Kayshawn Ford, Alex Figueroa. You know, going back to your son, September 27th, 1994. Um, we've had the f we had the 41 shots, you know, and then the 50 shots, and then who knows what else. But uh, we're coming down to the last few minutes. W can you leave us with some hope? I mean, what is it? I mean, this is wonderful, this outpouring of protests. This is unprecedented. Where do you think this is going? We have one minute. I am so, so enlightened and energized by the, the, the presence of all of the people and the outrage of the people. I mean, I was crying at that protest just because I was so overjoyed to see so many people saying to themselves, I mean, this is enough, you know. You're killing innocent, unarmed people who aren't committing crimes. This has to stop. You're justifying every case. You know what this 367 means to me? Innocent, that means that there are 367 officers still patrolling our streets who killed innocent people. And that's only in New York. And this is something that's happening around the country. That means there are many many officers out there who committed crimes who are still walking the streets. Thank you very much. Mm. Nicholas Hayward. Yeah. Thank you. Honored to be on your show.